the 1950s, India was newly independent, poor and still finding its footing. Yet Jawaharlal Nehru, the country's first Prime Minister, was already looking decades ahead. He wanted India not just to build dams and steel plants, but he also wanted the nation to leap straight into the modern technological age and that too with a supersonic fighter jet. Today we dive deep into the story of the Marut and India's fighter jet ambitions in this episode of Past Forward. Gamble Nehru took. He hired Kurt Tank, a former Nazi engineer who had designed one of World War II's most feared fighter planes. Tank had worked for the Luftwaffe or Nazi Germany's Air Force and his creation of the Fock Wolf 190 was a rugged, deadly aircraft that rivaled the British Spitfire and terrorized the Allied pilots. Now, Tank was in India tasked with building the country's very first indigenous combat jet. The result was the HAL HF-24 Marut, a bold, flawed experiment that remains one of the most ambitious technological projects India had ever attempted. The Indian Air Force wasn't thinking small. It wanted a Mark II fighter. The Mark II fighter was capable of flying at twice the speed of sound, at a time when India could barely produce cars. Kurt Tank and his colleagues, meanwhile, had drifted to Argentina after the World War II. Like most German scientists who were tied to the Nazi war machine, they were unwelcome in Europe. Thus, they found refuge in countries willing to buy their expertise. So Nehru lured Tank to Bangalore where he began working with senior Indian engineers and he also taught at the Madras Institute of Technology. It is important to note that one of his early students was Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam who went on to become the President of India. Coming back to Tank's team, they began from scratch. India had no design templates, no advanced wind tunnels, not even a local supply chain for aircraft parts. But in 1959, they produced a wooden mock-up, a full-scale model used mainly to test the cockpit layout and aerodynamics in the simplest way that was possible. In two years, by 1961, the first jet-powered prototype of the Marut took off over Bangalore with Wing Commander Suranjan Das, one of India's most skilled test pilots at the controls. For a nation less than 15 years old, without an aerospace industry itself or even reliable automobiles, the sight of an indigenous jet fighter in the sky was nothing short of astonishing. But under the sleek skin was a fatal flaw – its engines. India had no capacity to build modern turbojets, so the Marut was fitted with the Orpheus 703, a British engine designed for trainer jets and not fighter jets. Without a suitable afterburner, the Marut maxed out at Mark 0.95, forever stuck just below the supersonic threshold. This meant that the Marut couldn't catch faster enemy jets, break the sound barrier in battle or pull off certain high-speed maneuvers making it less effective despite its modern design. Now, India started to look for alternatives. Britain, the USSR and even a joint project with Egypt. But geopolitics killed every option. When the 1967 Arab-Israeli war broke out, the Egypt collaboration collapsed overnight. The Marut remained underpowered, a sports car saddled with a scooter engine. After the Indian government conducted its first nuclear tests at Pokhran in 1974, international pressure prevented the import of better engines and even spare parts for the Orpheus engines. This situation was one of the main reasons for the aircraft's early demise. 
even the weapons of the Marut had problems. Firing all four cannons at once shook the plane so badly that a test pilot was killed. To stay safe, squadrons flew only with two guns, cutting the firepower in half. Now, for all its flaws, the Marut was no museum piece. It actually went to war. During the 1971 war with Pakistan, Maruts flew more than 200 missions. Their finest hour came at the Battle of Longewala, where they teamed up with British-made hunters to blast advancing Pakistani tanks into burning wrecks, thus saving a tiny Indian desert outpost from being overrun during the 1971 war. In the skies, one Marut even managed to down a Pakistani F-86 Sabre. It's one and only air-to-air -air kill. The pilots respected the aircraft's toughness. It could survive heavy damage, fly back on one engine and stay stable at lower altitudes. In combat, it was dependable even though it was no match for the MiG-21 or the F-104 Starfighters. The Marut's failure was not just weak engines though, it was systemic. There were missed chances where Britain had offered to co-develop a more powerful version of the Orpheus engine, which could have finally pushed the Marut past the sound speed barrier. But India hesitated at the price tag and had to walk away. There was also mistrust between the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited or the HAL, which built the jet and the Indian Air Force, which had to fly it, were often at odds. Engineers complained that the Air Force did not give the project enough support. The pilots felt they were being handed an unfinished machine. That uneasy relationship never really healed and it still shadows India's defence industry even today. Then came the temptation of imports. By 1970s, India could simply buy Jaguars from Britain or MiGs from the Soviet Union. Their aircrafts were faster, more powerful and already proven in combat. Faced with that, few in the Air Force wanted to stick with an underpowered homegrown jet. In the end, about 147 Maruts were built. Some squadrons had unusually high strength of 32 aircraft. Yet, many jets logged only a handful of hours before being retired early on. Now, on 31st March 1990, the last Marut flew its final sortie, quietly closing a chapter that had begun with Nehru's audacious gamble three decades earlier. The Marut story is both a warning and an inspiration. It showed that India could leap into high technology if it dared. It also showed that vision without sustained investment and political will leads to mediocrity. Crucially, it revealed India's Achilles heel, engines. Six decades later, India has still not been able to crack this code. The Tejas LCA flies, but with American power plants. The AMCA project faces the same hurdle and the much-hyped Kaveri engine launched in the 1980s remains unfinished to this date. There's also the mindset problem time and again, India has preferred quick imports over painful persistence of homegrown designs. The Marut was the first casualty of this habit. The Tejas nearly became the second. Today, as India debates Rafales, Tejas and the Amka, the ghost of Marut lingers, a reminder that strategic autonomy requires more than ambition. It requires money, patience and above all, the grit to see projects through their long and painful birth. That is all from us today. This is Garama and you are watching The Asian Chronicles.